Hi there, I'm Bill Boggs, and do not go anywhere because Profiles with Vicki Burns is coming right up. Welcome to Profiles, I'm Mickey Burns. Today's guest is TV host and author Bill Boggs. Over his accomplished career, Bill has hosted more than a dozen television shows while earning four Emmy Awards along the way. In the 80s, Bill became the executive producer of the Morton Downey Jr. Show, which evolved into one of the most popular programs on television. After a short break, I'll be back to welcome TV host Bill Boggs to Profiles. Welcome back to Profiles, I'm Mickey Burns. Today's guest, TV host Bill Boggs, has interviewed hundreds of celebrities and newsmakers during his five-decade career. Bill is also the author of four books. His latest is titled, The Adventures of Spike the Wonder Dog. In the book, Bill writes in the voice of Spike, who becomes a TV star in his own right. So join me now as I welcome Bill Boggs to Profiles. Bill Boggs, welcome to our show, Profiles. I'm looking forward to this. Well, uh, it's, it's my pleasure. Thank because you. Because for our viewers, you are a TV host, have been for many years, producer, author, prolific author. Um, how, how are things going these days for you? How are things going? Yeah, because I know you spend the winters now in Florida. How are things going? Yes. Well, look, I'm alive. I, let's start there. I yeah. lived through the pandemic. Yes, sure. I have a terrific relationship. As soon as things get back on stage, I'm yes. doing stage shows. Yep. I got my book, it's which good, has gotten really good talk reviews. About it. Hey, you, how am I doing? My health seems to be good. I'm doing chin-ups. So the answer is I am you, a blessed man. And you look great. Thank you, I appreciate that. But yeah. you know, I'm sure you're using the Doris Day lens there. On the camera. <laughs> you know, with the, yeah. the Vaseline. The, the Barbara Walters lens. Yeah, that's it. Where the nose disappears. There's yeah. so much stuff on the camera. <laughs> now, Bill, you've hosted more than a dozen, as we, as yeah. we talked about before, television shows uh, while winning four Emmy Awards along the way. But my question is, as a TV host, what, what is it that fascinates you about the interviewing process? I think listening, actually. Really? You know, assuming that I can hear. Yeah, I, <laughs> my hearing has not improved yep. since my days in basic training. <laughs> yeah. um, I think really just listening. Yeah. When I, my second job in television was in Philadelphia. I was a so, associate producer of a show called McLean and Company. Yeah, yeah. And I was on once a week on KYW TV yeah. as Mr. Weekend telling people in Philadelphia where to go and what to do. Wow, but wow. anyway, the host, McLean, was a very good listener. And I, used, I, ah. would, I knew this is what I wanted to do, right? right? And I just would watch him. And he'd have notes, but the best stuff happened when he just responded. He's listening. Uh, yeah, so my technique has always been to really not, unless you're on like when I was at WNBC a weekend today in New York Anchor, and you got three minutes and you got to follow you your You stay course. with the script. If you're doing yeah. more of a long form interview to listen and have a little part of yourself thinking about what's going to be most entertaining for the audience. That's I got that from yeah, reading yeah. a Burt Lancaster um, biography. Yeah, Burt, yeah, always yeah. when he was performing in a movie, had a sense of the audience watching him. Oh, Not all actors yeah, yeah. would be doing that. Right. But I've always had the sense of someone watching. It's a great tip. Now, you worked in Philadelphia, as you mentioned, but you grew up there as well. Uh, and early in your childhood, I read somewhere that you realized that one of your gifts was public speaking. Yeah. And that's I, rare for a young man to realize that. It's the number one fear, by the way. Yes, I know. But, you know, the, the Jerry Seinfeld line is, you know, more people are afraid of public speaking than dying. <laughs> so at a funeral, they'd rather be in the casket than delivering the eulogy. It is so true. But, you know, the, the public school education in Philadelphia, there yeah. we were in the fifth grade. Each kid, of 32 kids in the class, had yeah. to get up and speak. Wow. And a couple, a couple of the kids actually were so scared they wet their pants. Are you a sure? couple of others got up and there. I got up and for the only gift I think that I've been given. Was public speaking. There I was. Wow. This was funny. Wow. People were laughing. And so I did recognize And that's where you recognize yeah. it as a young man. Yeah. Now, over your career, 
for our viewers, you've interviewed hundreds of celebrities yeah. and newsmakers. I've been lucky. At what age did you realize, you know, I think I could make a career out of doing so? Out of, out of doing that? Of, of interviewing uh, oh. as, a, as a career. Five, age five? No, I'm not really? kidding. Wow. I, I listened to the talk show hosts on the radio and television, and that's what I wanted to do. Right from when five I was a, years old. My mother tells a story yes. that I used to walk around the house, Mickey, with a yeah. pencil pretending to interview people when I was five years old. Wow. So for me, it's been a case of this is what I wanted to do, and then actualizing my childhood dream. Wow. When I say that I'm a fortunate, blessed individual, yeah. I really am grateful yeah, yeah. that I could make that dream come true. Sure. Before we talk about your career track, yeah. I did want to mention, uh, and I read somewhere, but, it, but is it true uh, that Frank Sinatra's first television talk show appearance was on your show Midday Live here in New York City? Yeah. In, uh, the first, his in first September appearance. of 1975, which is in the pre-Kardashian era of yeah. television. <laughs> Thank you. Yep. The, uh, Frank was on my show, the longest interview of his life, and as he states on the program, right. I think this is the first time I've ever, I've ever done one of these. And he came wow. for the taping. Wow. Yeah. Uh, uh, explain, share with us how you got that rare interview. I simply and, met Frank Sinatra. Four o'clock in the morning at the Caesar's Palace oh. on Easter weekend. And in the, it was introduced by Jilly. Right. And I had been partying all weekend. We saw Elvis first show, Sinatra yeah, yeah, second yeah, yeah, show. Yeah, yeah. Jilly ran into me at three in the morning and said, right. Would you like to meet Frank? Come back in 45 minutes. About quarter to four Easter Sunday morning at yeah. Caesar's Palace, I got introduced to Frank. We just hit it off. That was it. We just connected. And at the end of about a 10-minute conversation, he said, Jilly says, you have a show on five in New York? I said, yeah. yeah. He said, well, look, I don't want to promise anything. This is April, yeah. but I'm going to be in New York in uh, September yeah, with yeah. Ellen Basie. Maybe I'll come and do your show. And I instantly put up my hands like this. I said, Frank, I'm not asking for anything. Right. I was just happy he to meet that. him. He liked he that. He pulled my hands down. He looks at me with these cobalt blue eyes, and he says, Billy... I know you're not asking. Maybe I'll come. And he did. Yeah, so I just yeah. met him. That, that's incredible because most people are asking for something, you know. Yeah. Now, you also had a great interview, which I happen to like, with Sammy Davis Jr. Yes. Uh, what do you remember most about that interview with uh, Sammy? Oh, Sammy Davis Jr. I first met in 1967 when I was assistant dean of Penn and managing the comedy whoa, team whoa. when I got into show business. So I had yeah, known yeah. Sammy a long time. And I think what I most remember about that is Sammy's frankness talking about his drug problems, well, which is was... why he wrote the book that he's promoting. Yeah, and just yeah. to give you an idea how gracious he was, after the interview, oh. we said, I'm in Atlantic City this weekend. Come down, bring as many people as you want. I took my mother and my cousins. After the show, he took us up to his dressing room and took pictures with our cameras, right, of um, us, and then we took pictures. Of, Sammy Davis Jr. is a uniquely gracious individual. That's a great story. Now, besides Frank and Sammy, who else would you consider, of all the celebrities that you've had on your shows, to be among the most memorable? Well, I'll give you a stream of consciousness, all right? Looking into the green cat eyes of Sophia Loren with her beautiful olive skin, or looking into Miles Davis, you know, wearing, wearing sunglasses wow. and communicating with wow. Miles Davis. Or Rosa Parks, the woman who wouldn't sit in the back of the bus. Yeah, sure. The strength and the dignity that this wow. woman, or wow. Jesse Owens. Wow. Or Muhammad Ali on the comeback trail. <laughs> oh, wait, you want me to stop? No, I'm going to throw a name in. Yeah. Because I don't know if it was on your show, but you interviewed her. Tina Turner. Well, Tina Turner goes all the way back to... 1973. I saw that. I saw a long, that. long, long time ago. My first show in North Carolina, which, by the way, when we talk about the book, that's yeah. where the show well, I'm going to talk about starts. That. Yeah. I got and you covered. Tina, I saw, I saw you know, I, I, Tina Turner in, in 73 in Greensboro Coliseum. And, you know, her body language in, that, in the interview is, yeah. is, is, is sort of protective yeah, because yeah, of what yeah. she was going through. Yeah, that was what she was going through with. Uh, she was going through with it. With Ike. Yeah. 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 Now, I read somewhere that the first time you ever you you were ever in a nightclub, you got to see Frank Sinatra That's perform. Correct. 
Sinatra in the 500 Club. I was yeah. 17 years old, snuck in. Shouldn't have been there. No, I snuck in dressed yeah. as a busboy. You couldn't get a ticket. So I, I and a friend, Dave Fixer, went through the back door, yeah. and we got in there thinking the show was supposed to start at 11, yeah. but the people from the 9 o'clock show were just leaving, yep. and we were dressed as busboys. So Mickey, an hour and a half, we walked around setting up tables. <laughs> the yes, it's true. The room fills up. Yeah. This is what I call a preview of adult life. We were pretending to work. Right? <laughs> Sinatra comes out, and I was mesmerized. Blow, blown away. And I fell in love with Frank that night and started to get every album. And wow. I'm a true believer. And a lifelong fan. Yeah. Um, let's talk about your book. Yes, the book. <laughs> you got a book. There it is, The Adventures of Spike the Wonder Dog. Now, this is a key. As told to Bill Boggs. I didn't write the book. The dog narrated <laughs> well, the story uh, yes. to me. Yes. Well, that's what makes it creative. In that, in that you wrote this book, really, in the voice of Spike. Yes, it's, it, it's written, the, the, the book is narrated by a dog. Yep. So we understand, it's not a children's story. It's an R-rated book, politically incorrect humor, warning on the cover of the book, okay? <laughs> it's a satire, it's absurdist humor, and it's about a dog who becomes a big TV star. Well, that's my next With a master like me. Yes, and my next question is, how did Spike become a TV star? Well... The dog Spike is based on is a dog named Spike. And my dog in North Carolina, who was on my show, got to be very popular just by doing crazy things like yawning, licking. <laughs> you know, I have a female. He loved females. And he'd lick their ankles. <laughs> maybe. And he got a lot of mail. And before I came to New York, yeah. the dog was killed by a drunk driver. Oh, so the idea oh. for the book was, what if the dog, Spike, yeah. the wonder dog is what we call him in North right, Carolina, right. had come to New York with me in today's world and became a big TV star. Sure, and when, when the fan mail started to come in, you were the host of the show, the star of the show. Right. I read that somewhere- That was Southern Exposure, the High Point show. Yeah, I read somewhere he was getting three times the, the fan mail you were getting. We still got along. <laughs> Let me, uh, you know, my, when I read the book, I said, most of us can relate to this book. And then one reviewer wrote exactly what I was feeling, and that is, and this is what the reviewer wrote. He said, so many of us have pets with very human-like personalities. That's right. And it's so true. I mean, I had a dog for 17 years, and, you know, at the holidays, he had his own dish of food. I mean, he was like one of the family. The dogs are one of the family. Amazing. I, I, I absolutely love I don't have a dog now, but I, I love dogs, and the fact that the book is written and it's narrated by a dog. Yes. For example, The Art of Racing in the Rain, right. that's narrated by a dog. <laughs> uh, the Call of the Wild, that's yeah. narrated by a dog. Sure, yeah, yeah. The thing that... I've been most gratified about this book. This is a humor book. Yes. Tim Allen, you know, asked me about the book. I said, yeah. Tim, it's 280 pages of comedy writing. Right. And lest, and it we, is. lest we forget, I actually began my career as a comedy writer. Right. Way, way, way right. back. Right. So the critics said that Spike the Wonder Dog is the funniest dog ever to appear in print. Well said. And that, that makes me really happy. I want to read one more review. Only one? That's... <laughs> And the reviewer said, if Spike was human, I can envision him being a stand-up comedian in the vein of the late George Carlin. God, I love George Carlin. And who was better than George Carlin? That's the highest compliment you could give the book. I think it is. Yeah. And of course, the book is filled, as you mentioned, with tons of politically incorrect humor. Yes. And, and it's a great book. I did read it, and I wish you best of luck with it. Thank you. Did you laugh at all? In all reading? through the whole thing. Yeah, good. That's my goal. And I, I was more taken back by the creativity. It's not easy writing in, in the voice of a dog. As soon as I started writing this book, within 10 minutes, what, a magical thing happened, and the dog's voice was coming through me. Great job with it. Thank now, you. I want to go back to your career. Sure. Oh, wait. The book is part of my career. Oh, it is? Well, no, now I'm a writer course. now. I'm a full time writer now. That's, this is what I, I do. Oh, I know that. This is not your first book. My third book. I know that. Yeah. And you're going to write a sequel, so then you'll have four. 160 pages, Mickey. Go get them, kid. 160 Go get, You'll get it. You'll now, get the it only done. reason I say that is that when my last television show, which was on PBS, went off the air six years ago, yes. I've been chasing jobs all my life. Yeah, I mean, talk yeah. about what it takes to have a career. You've you know, you got to be aggressive. Not step on people, but be, be aggressive. I said to Jane, my girlfriend, Jane Rothschild, I said, you know, I'm just going to focus on writing. I just thought I'm getting older. I'm in my 70s. Who wants me? But I want to write. And yeah. that's why that is the evolution of my career. Yeah. Reinventing yourself is a crucial thing. Look at you. <laughs> Thank you. In 1988, 
you left doing a hosting a morning show in Philadelphia to become Morton Downey Jr.'s executive producer on his show. Yes. Why did you decide to make that transition from hosting to executive producer? What's the most famous line in The Godfather? I'm not sure. They made me an offer I, I couldn't refuse. refuse. I, it was a combination of doubling my salary. Which right, was which thing. was important. And honestly, it had to do with the Chippendales. I had been hosting shows from High Point, North Carolina for three years and yeah. 13 years in New York, 16 years, and I'm back on television again. Yeah. And I really felt like I was repeating myself. I didn't have all the control in, in order, to, and I thought to do the best possible work. Yeah. And I was in the middle of interviewing the Chippendales, you know, with these shaved chests, <laughs> but asking the same dumb questions yeah, yeah, I asked yeah. four other times, and I like thought bubble. Maybe there's something else to do in <laughs> life. Right. And right. that's when you said, let me and try. No, and then they were looking for an executive producer, yeah. Morton Downey, and Bob Pittman yeah. said, hey, Boggs knows how to produce, and he's you a think? talk show host. Maybe he would do Downey. So that's what well, happened. Well, you, you took the job, and in my opinion, you two were like the odd couple. Oh, yes. However, <laughs> as executive producer, you did end up with one of the hottest and most popular shows on television. Yes. How did you feel about that accomplishment? I had, a, honestly, I don't want to sound like a politician here, but I had a great team. I mean, one of the guys on, on the team has gone on to be the most successful show in history of daytime television, yeah. another guy. The team was great. And Mort it wasn't was one. You I had was, several that went on to have solid yeah, careers, several producer, right? Executive producer of the Donahue show. Yes, yes. I took the approach, the leadership approach of get talented people, yeah. and give them free reign. So wow. I would okay. sit in my office and just continue to look at the big picture of the Morton Downey Jr. show yeah, yeah. and try to manage Mort, who was an extremely self-destructive, three-pack-a-day smoker and right, self-destructive right. in terms of... His daughter said to me, God, I hope the show works for Dad. It seems like after two years, everything he does collapses. And right. two years later, the show went off the air. Then you said, you, back then, yeah. you said... Um, it was the fastest rising show and the fastest falling show in syndication. Yes, in the history of television. Fastest rise and fall. Actually, Regis Philbin said that, and he was correct. And, and the reason for the fast fall was? Morton Downey's behavior off camera. Morton Downey was doing everything he could to get himself in the National Enquirer, the star. At one point, he called the National Enquirer and told him he had seen UFOs. At another time, he took out his caps and pose like for Halloween, like a, uh, you know, yeah, yeah, a yeah, vampire. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then the, the, the shaved head incident where he shaved his head and said he was attacked by yeah, skinheads. Yeah, 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 and yeah, yeah. all of that, that was a lie. On the air, he was brilliant. Yeah, he but was. it was the off the air stuff, you know. Well, so the, the powers that be at Universal just didn't want to deal with the guy anymore. Okay. That was it. <clears throat> Before we get back to your career, because I want to just Give, give us an overview of all the places that you've worked yeah. as a host. Before we do that, for many years, you were an active member of the famed 150-year-old Friars Club on East yes, 55th it's true. Street. Yes, that's true. Home yeah. to, that was home to a who's who in show business. What's happening over there, and what's the current status of the club? I know current it's status of the club is it's it's it's, it's having a soft reopening. Yeah. So it's it's coming back. Is it? The Forest Club needs an infusion of new new members, and ultimately it would be a social club, which it already is, with a strong show business resonance. It's not finished, but it's not what it was. It every the, 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 you can't continue to think that everything is going to stay as it was. Right. So it's, it's right. growing and changing. It's a great and, facility. Oh, the, 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 it's whole, the whole house has been completely renovated. It's, right. They polished the walls. They stripped the wood. It's gorgeous. Right. I know they've had, they also had financial issues. Big financial issues. Okay. Ever since 2008 and, and, you know, the collapse, most clubs in New York took a shot. Yeah. I'm still a member, you know. I know you are. You're active. You, you, you hosted many, many uh, affairs there. Just give us an overview, Bill, for our viewers. How many different shows you've hosted over your career? I know the Food Channel, you did a oh, couple geez. of great... Oh, well, I'll try to run through it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In North Carolina, I did Southern Exposure and a once a week show called The Late Bill Boggs, which was a very advanced show where we had strippers, hookers, all kinds <laughs> of 
people on the show. Oh, okay. So that okay. was, and then I came up to New York, midday live with Bill Boggs, Saturday morning live on Channel 5, yeah. a syndicated show called Comedy Tonight. Wow. That was on for two years, uh, 121 stations, wow. a special for NBC, uh, a game show for CBS called All Star Anything Goes, the show in Philadelphia, Time, Time Out, My Generation for the AARP. And I, I've taken these experiences and I've crafted them into five stage shows. I've, I've been to one. Yeah. Talk show, confidential, yeah, uh, Confessions yeah, yeah. of a Talk Show, Memories of Sinatra, Rat Pack Revisited, Voices of Our Time, where I talk about all the singers I've interviewed and show yeah, clips yeah. And, and music music performances, and Fun at the Food Network. That I was spent great stuff. Ten years at the Food Network. Wow, yeah. wow. As an interviewer, today when you're watching television, who do you feel are the best interviewers on television? Stephen Colbert, in my opinion, is as good as anyone. He's bright. Anyone who has ever done late night. He's as good as, different, yeah. as good as Carson, as good as they, anyone. My two favorite interviewers, most authentic interviewers right now would be David Letterman. Yeah, he's, he's bright. And a new series he's doing with the beard. Why, David? Why, please? Yeah. Anyway, the beard. <laughs> and I love Jerry Seinfeld when he's driving around with the comedians because Seinfeld is so supremely confident which really helps you. Sure does. Interview. So I would sure say the does. answer, my well, favorite interview right now is Letterman. Yeah, yeah. Besides listening that you mentioned before, as one of your, the keys to being yes. a good interviewer, yes. what would you say are some of the other keys to your success as a TV host? Luck. Luck, be in the right place at the right time. Appearance. Um, yeah, yeah. The aggression. I, I'm a firm believer in manifesting what your dreams are. Yeah, and yeah. when I, I say aggression, I don't mean stepping on people. I mean, what, do you, what does it take to, you know, to get this guest? And, wow. and have, wow. oh, and I think having people, because if you're the talk to host, you're like the leader, when you walk into the office in the morning, people are looking at you like the leader, is yeah, setting yeah. a good example with, with your work ethic for the people with whom mm -hmm. you work and then treating them like gold because without those people, man, where are you? So a lot of it is, is just basic management, but I think f for a five-year-old who wanted to be a talk show host, yeah. the number one thing that helped me was believing yeah. that I could do it. Wow, confidence. Believing that confidence. I could do it. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and you've had a, a tremendous Frank Sinatra career. said to me, yeah. you're very powerful provided you know how powerful you are. That's some good advice. Yeah. And, and some of this that you just mentioned is good advice to beginning people who would like to follow in your footsteps. Yeah. Years from now, Bill, when you reflect back. I hope I, I'm alive. Well, you, now, you're reflecting back now, I, 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 I think. Uh, what do you hope your legacy is going to be? You know, I, I honestly would like my legacy to be mm. that I brought information out of people because I helped to make them comfortable. The number one thing guests would say to me after a show, gee, Bill, I, fe I felt really comfortable. <laughs> and you know, Sinatra's yeah, people said, yeah. yeah, Frank was really comfortable. I think that, I, you know, I, I would honestly like, like my legacy to, to be more about the good that I've done and the friendships that I made and, and what, I, what I've done for people. But in terms of my work, just that I contributed insights into notable people mm. because of some small ability to draw information out of them. And you continue to do a lot of that. Uh, I want a to nice say, question. Thank you. I want to say one more time. Uh, I want to thank you so much for stopping by Profiles today. And once again, I want to thank you for hosting, guest hosting, our 500th episode about a year ago. You did a wonderful job and you flew all the way up from Florida to do it. That's and right. I so appreciate that. Well, that's how desperate I was to be on television. <laughs> yeah, I just had to, had and, to do that. <laughs> and, and also, I want to <laughs> I want to wish you best of luck with your, uh, your new book release. And once again, it's titled The Adventures of Spike the Wonder Dog. And you write in the voice of Spike. And I want to wish you also continued success, Bill. Good health. Your health is your wealth. It's the most important thing anyone ever said to me. My father said that. Your health is your wealth. And it's so Everything true. Everything is pinned on health. It's so God true. God bless you. Thank you. Thank you, Mickey. Thank you, Bill. Today in his 70s, Bill spends much of his time writing. He's currently working on his fifth book, 
Additionally, over his career as a television host, Phil has interviewed many of the biggest names in show business, leaving behind a body of work that few can rival. Well, that's about all the time we have left on this edition of Profiles. Until next time, I'm Mickey Burns. Thanks for tuning in. Alan Zweibel, original Saturday Night Live writer and Thurber Prize winning author of The Other Showman says, The Adventures of Spike the Wonder Dog is so smart, witty, and inventive that I had to keep reminding myself that I didn't write it.